And what a better one to address this one of the presentation is, I thought it's for me, the best one qualified who will be delivering it. I may be long gone from commissioner or dead, you know, somebody who can carry on, would be the CEO or the new CEO of the board, uh, Phyllis Sethoff, who will do the presentation. And I want to give you background, a lot of you know her. She began a maritime carrier at Port Freeport in 1992. She served as the managing director and then in April 2012 became the interim CEO. Before she decided, before we can select her for the CEO, she decided to go to, like in BSF we say, to graduate school in Ludwigshafen, Germany. So she decided to go to the graduate school, quote unquote, at Port Houston. And uh, there she has been there since October 2012. And so it has a lot of positions, including Deputy Executive Board Director. And then after graduating from the graduate work and doing some postdoctoral work, like to say, uh, we were fortunate to have her rejoin our board when the CEO Executive Director position opened up. And in fact, today is her 31st day of work. I mean, so uh, she's well qualified to be able to talk about it because that's one of the projects, Andy. We talked with her during our interview. Uh, this is the project to look at. Uh, during her time, and this makes also sense when she was here at Freeport, uh, she started the deep wing project. She was involved in getting all the permits and all for 45 feet and getting the 45 feet project. So what better one is to see this thing go on and complete it. Uh, just before I stop here, she has been recognized as the top 10 women in the Gulf Port Transportation by Gulf Shipper Magazine. She has a bachelor's of degree in accounting, and she wouldn't forget that, <laughs> with Magna Cum Laude from the University of Houston in Clear Lake. She has been a Brazoria County resident, as June knows, since 1983, and has two children, I mean, one daughter grown up working in Virginia, and one son still on the payroll, going to Texas a and again. So, uh, it's happening there. So, let me turn this over to Phyllis, and let's welcome our new board director. Well, good afternoon, and uh, it's good to be home. I'm uh, very happy to be back at Port Freeport, and uh, a lot of exciting things happening, as you've already seen today, um, through Robbie's presentation. I'm really excited about the ability for us to um, maybe create what I would consider a more even larger regional concept with, with our port and, uh, and working cooperatively with our adjacent county, of Fort Bend County. Um, it really, uh, I guess, brings together the vision that we've had for this port for a long time. We, we knew we were strategically located in the Gulf. We've been silently, quietly, working away, growing our port, going a little bit unnoticed, but we're now being, we're now being noticed. I've attended uh, the inaugural Journal of Commerce Gulf Shipping Conference yesterday in Houston, and um, Freeport was definitely a topic of discussion, and clearly we are the port that has the ability to have the deep water, and the shipping lines have recognized that, and uh, so we, we are being noticed now and the future is bright, but we've got some things we have to get done in order to really capitalize on the, the things that are ahead of us. And I would also like to add, uh, Mr. Singh, on your comments about the Houston not even being able to capture all of the Asia shipments that are going into the direct market there in Houston. There was a, pre a presentation by a gentleman from Academy. Academy is based in Houston, and up until this last uh, round with labor disputes on the West Coast, they were shipping less than 10% through the Gulf into the Houston market. Almost all of their goods were moving through the West Coast, some through the East Coast, and a very small fraction, like 5% through the West Coast. They're trying to bring about a better balance. Um, they're over 10% now into through the Gulf into the Houston market, but that's an indicator of the opportunity. Um, these customers need reliability, 
and they need competitive rates, but they do need the reliability that they don't always get on the West Coast. And when you have the labor disruptions, it's very, very costly and very difficult to, to meet the expectations of your, of your customers when you can't get the goods to the shelves. So uh, through experience, uh, they're actively looking for that competitive uh, supply chain and uh, into the Gulf if it, at all possible. So let's talk a little bit more about this more regional concept and, and what has to be done in order to make it successful and who's really playing those uh, larger roles. You know, this is what we've been talking about. The, the Panama Canal expansion is opening up new opportunities for the Gulf. And we're gonna talk about what in, what's in red there really is more port free port focused and then what we're doing further inland and how we're partnering um, to, to develop opportunity there and how to connect all of this uh, all of this together. Now, when I came on board, I was hearing all the discussion about, about all this. And so this was just my attempt to lay this out in a way that we could all logically think about the processes and what has to has to have come happen in certain sequences in order for it to, to be successful. So first of all, let's talk about the Panama Canal. The Panama Canal really is a, is a game changer for the Gulf. Previously, um, it was a longer transit time to bring the larger vessels into the Gulf. And the Panama Canal expansion, when it opens, um, we're just about a week away from the first official transit through the canal on the 26th, uh, we will be able to um, enjoy the new Panamax size ships coming through the Panama Canal and shortening that transit time into the Gulf, which that shorter transit time, um, again, translates directly to the bottom line of our, you know, our BCOs, or our beneficial cargo owners, and the operating cost of, of the vessels. Now, if we're going to have a more competitive situation for larger vessels coming into the Gulf, we have to have um, a channel that can accommodate those larger vessels. I'm trying to brace this up so if I move, it doesn't change. So this is why we have said that we need to have a deeper and wider channel. We're presently at 45 feet, but as the chairman mentioned, we have been authorized to take our channel to 50 and 55 feet. The 55 feet would be up into this reach of the channel, and then as you come on around this bend, then it would um, come down to 50 feet. But it's important, in fact, unless the terminal is here, we need that 50 feet of water all the way to our container facility. Now, in further studying the project as it was designed by, by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, we've discovered that we would like um, a little more flexibility in our channel to increase navigation safety and, um, and uh, just further enhance our channel. And we're, we're pursuing a further modification in this reach right here so that vessels can come in, reposition before they make this portion, transit of this portion of the channel. We want to make sure that everybody is comfortable that they can bring those larger vessels into Port Freeport. This is uh, not any different than what we did with the 45 foot project. Um, anytime you work with the US Army Corps of Engineers, it's not as efficient a process as you would like. And when you're trying to predict the future and the size of vessels, and it takes you more than a decade to get a project approved, sometimes 10, 15 years, the the market can change. So that happened with us when we took the, uh, received our authorization to go to 45 feet. Um, when we post receiving the author authorization, we eased that portion of the channel. Oops, let me go back. We eased this portion of the channel with the 45 foot project. So we're doing the same thing again with this 55 foot project. The rate of change in the size of vessels in recent years has been much accelerated over what it had been in history. Um, I've had a slide I've often used which showed that up until the 1980s there were very few changes in the container vessel market. And then we saw a slight increase in the size and then, you know, now we're talking vessels carrying 22,000 units. I mean, that's, who would have envisioned that? It's just amazing. So. Don't expect to see those in the Gulf anytime soon, but um, but they but again, it's just uh, it's been a very innovative period, and 
something that wasn't completely forecasted when we began the project uh, or pursuing the authorization to go to 55 feet. But this enhancement again will um, give our customers and our potential customers the assurances that we have the, the dimensions in the channel to support these larger vessels that will be transiting the Panama Canal. This is a priority project for us. If we go back to the previous um, previous slide where I showed the little boxes. We have the Panama Canal opening later this month. We have to have the deep water if we want to see those larger vessels calling Port Freeport first. You don't want to be a later port to call. We want to be the first port to call. So um, the depth is important. Well, and if we go forward and we have our deeper, wider channel and we're able to accommodate those larger ships, we need to be able to handle them presently have our container terminal. It is 800 foot of berth. We have the two gantry cranes uh, capable of handling post Panamax size vessels and we're handling about 125,000 um, TEUs a year right now. Uh, we think that'll grow and we're already preparing for that goal of growth. We're, we're in the process of permitting our next two berths. Those berths, um, again, that would include the dredging that are required um, in, in front of them. And uh, once we are complete with our expansion and full build out, you'll see that we'll have about 2,400 linear feet of berth, at least I would think nine gantry cranes on those berths. And this is just completely conceptual, an idea of what it could look at, look like when we go to full engineering design, of course, we will, um, it, could, it could look different, but you'll see that we'll also have integrated rail facilities there. Um, and then, you know, storage of empties further back in, in our property, but with this, with the loaded boxes um, going, going to and from the vessels. This, is, this would give us the capability of moving 1.5 million TEUs on, the, on an annual basis. This is, significant, this is a significant size terminal and uh, one that will definitely uh, be able to, to service the market we're after. Now, we build a container terminal here. We have on dock rail. We also have to continue to develop and connect the rail um, that Mr. Chairman Sinhanya mentioned over in this area where we anticipate having intermodal facilities and um, other rail capability. But you'll see this little red line across here. We envision, again, continuing to expand across the river. We can have a you know, an immediate intermodal area across the river, but we, again, want to expand our reach. If we want to handle larger volumes of uh, containers through the port and reach more inland markets, we have to be able to provide all modes of transportation. And that's, you know, we're excited about the expansion of Highway 36, but not everything will, will be able to go on, on the highway. So we want to have that inland rail connectivity. And why is that important? We talked about the change that the Panama Canal is bringing. Well, that change shifts and makes us more competitive so that our market reach is much expanded. What you see in, in blue here is much larger than what we're presently serving or what, what is really uh, considered competitive as far as the, the, the Gulf being able to serve. But with the expanded Panama Canal and with appropriate channel and rail infrastructure, we can expand that market up into the Midwest. And then you see these dotted lines here. Really, the reach extends there. It's a little less competitive, but, but um, it is definitely a market that we, we can reach and um, continue to strive to, to serve. So this is where the 36A rail, rail corridor, why it's so important. Right now, if you try to take all of your rail um, through using UP Railroad, they are the rail service that um, serves the, this area. If you try to just use that rail service, you're, you're sending everything right through the middle of Houston, and it adds an additional five days of transit time to a box moving on rail. So we need alternatives around Houston and that get us to market more quickly if we want to compete um, into the, to the Midwest. So the, the Port Freeport and Rosenberg connection is, is very important because 
the Rosenberg has um, all three Class 1 railroads located there. You have the BNSF, you have UP Railroad, and the KCS. So that's about a 60 mile, 58, 60 miles between Freeport and, and Rosenberg. And this is why the partnership between Brazoria County, Fort Bend County, and Fort Freeport is so important because we have to work together if we're going to um, see that Greenfield development occur. There's a lot of work to be done as uh, Mr. Commissioner Myers mentioned, and uh, we're, we're, just in, we're just beginning. Yeah, let's, I can leave this here. So the rail to Rosenberg, this is where the Brazoria County, Fort Bend County Rail District was formed, why it was formed. It was to help complete this segment of the intermodal system here that we're talking about when you look at us from a regional, a regional perspective. And uh, the group uh, is really getting organized there as uh, Commissioner Myers mentioned they recently um, initiated a good study uh, by Anders Kurtz to really look at their, um, you know, what their authorities are and how the different entities need to be um, working together under an interlocal agreement for uh, the, the rail district to be able to accomplish what uh, it needs to. They'll also be working to put together an information package to um, go out and to seek interested parties and in participating in the financing and development of this rail corridor. Um, there will be other studies and information put together because we have to identify routes. So if you know people ask you of, about routes and different things, we're still in the process of um, you know getting ready to to do that that amount of work. And if we have an interested party in participating in this from a financial standpoint, they would um, would be engaged in that process as well. And then we also have to go to the uh, NTSB and. Um, and present this project to them as well. So there's a lot of work to be done, to be done, but working together, I think we can make it happen. But Port Freeport, right now, our part directly as a port authority is the development of the channel, making sure we have the deep water, we can accommodate the larger vessels, and making sure that we have the dockside facilities available and ready and uh, for service when the lines call. So, and then we have to, we're working with the rail district in Missouri County and Fort Bend County to see this part of it happen. And I'm sure <coughs> Commissioner Andy Myers is working with his uh, local group to see that there are further developments as far as being an inland port location that can be the connection point to go all the way to Dallas or Orbit. And, and I put a couple little arrows there at the top. It's not just, uh, just Dallas or Worth, but we want to look beyond that. Does that connects us, you know, connects us east, west, and, uh, and, and north as well. So really excited about this. I, you hear a lot of talk about regional ports. Um, maybe Texas needs a regional port. We can be that regional port. Um, we have the right infrastructure, the right assets. We're gifted with um, a short channel for transit to maintain. We've got the authority to go deep. We have the acreage available to develop to support this. And we have the partnership of the people here in, in this room and in this region. And together, uh, I'm excited about the future for Freeport. Now, Chairman Zihangian, would you like to come up and make a few closing remarks? Go to the next slide. Yeah. Is that okay? Thank you. Well, first of all, uh, what Phyllis didn't say, she would be at the Panama Canal grand opening <laughs> on June the 26th as Port Freeport representatives. And it's a very honor that Port Freeport was considered to be on the Dwight list too. So uh, that, that's great. And Ambassador Sosa has been a very big supporter for uh, this project that Andy, Jude, and all of us started that. In wrapping it up over here, I want to say again uh, that to make all this thing happen, I mean, we all have worked uh, together as commissioners and the staff. I mean, first of all, we want to be sure it makes business sense. We just don't want to build it. Uh, as they, I always call it a white elephant or a monument, you know. I've done a few in my life, so I don't want any more. But anyway, it, it has to make a business sense. And uh, we have a very good, uh, what I call base here, 55 feet depth channel that we can get closest to deep water, just south of convergence of three main rail lines. 
and uh, a very good financial rating for our port and all. And then for these projects to happen, the community, I know very well, have to work together. And you can see this is happening over here. I mean, you are sitting here, uh, Andy is sitting here, and the people like you all will be helping make a lot of this thing happen. They're here and the whole, everybody's supporting. And we can keep growing and keep a sustainable growth and a responsive growth. So with this, I'd like to thank you all for coming. And if you have any questions, uh, uh, I mean, we'll try to answer.